oh my God, something's wrong with me. I'm not doing it right. I need to get a different job. They should have never given me this promotion. Don't make it mean that. Make it mean you're doing something new. You're on the bike. You're three years old. You don't know what you're doing yet. (laughs) You're going to feel shaky. Welcome to The Art of Speaking Up, a podcast that empowers professional women to rise. I'm your host, Jessica Guzik. And in this show, I take you undercover into the stories and lessons that I learned, sometimes the hard way, throughout my career. I also talk with working women, leaders, and coaches to show you that no matter what your struggle is and no matter what your career goals are, you already have all the talent that you need to succeed. I am so excited and I have been so excited to share this conversation with you because if there is one thing that has been difficult for me and I suspect maybe has also been difficult for you, it is the things that my mind does to make me feel like I'm somehow not good enough. And so much, so much of where I have struggled in my professional life has not happened out in the real world. They are not struggles that actually were occurring. They are things that were happening in my mind. They were worried, fearful thoughts about whether I was doing well enough or whether I was being judged or whether I was meeting the bar. And they, of course, affected my behavior. But the eye of the storm, the source of the pain was all in my brain and all of the challenging and often negative thoughts that it would generate about me and about how I was doing. And if you're listening, I'm sure you can imagine what it is like to be in a work environment where you want to be doing well and your brain is telling you that you're horrible and you suck and it results in a lot of pain. And on this show, we want to get rid of the pain. We want to move through the pain so we can get to a better feeling place. And I think that this episode will help you do that if you relate to any of these struggles yourself. Today's guest, you will hear her introduce herself. She is a mindset coach and she specializes in coaching working women just like you and me through some of the stuff that we deal with often in our minds when we are feeling self-sabotaging and self-judging and perfectionistic and worried and not confident in ourselves at work. When I spoke with Erin about some of these topics, and we talk about a lot of stuff, we talk about perfectionism and the fear of judgment and how we're afraid of what people think about us in a workplace. When I talked with her about these topics, I felt like she was in my brain, like the level of precision and accuracy with which she described things that I have experienced was like... I I felt like she was my doppelganger. And so if you're listening, you may have a similar feeling. It was such a relief and also so much fun. And it almost made some of these things feel humorous and lighter. It was such a relief to hear her talk about these inner mindset struggles and for her to share that this is something that she sees a lot in her clients and that this is normal and that it's something that we can all move through. So if you are ever hard on yourself, if you ever struggle to feel confident, if you're afraid that you're not good enough for your job or you don't belong or you suffer from imposter syndrome and you want to move past all of that and start getting to a point where you feel better, this episode is for you. I am so excited for you to meet Erin, for you to hear all of her wisdom, and hopefully for you to start to see things a little bit differently. And with that, let's meet today's guest and jump into the conversation. Enjoy. So I'm Erin Foley, and I am, it's funny, I've played around with my actual title a lot because I used to call myself a career coach, but people would get confused by that a lot and think that 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 tends to draw people in who are like, what do I want to do with my life? Oh my God, I don't know. So what I, what I say now is I'm actually a professional development coach. So that means that I work with women who are having some sort of blocks around their professional development. They're dealing with like mindset struggles, imposter syndrome, a lot of perfectionism, fear of judgment, fear of failure. 
and they want to feel calm. They want to feel confident. They want to show up in their full potential. A lot of those women are in a new job or role. So it's something they've been in in the last probably one to three years. And that's when a lot of these sort of mindset monsters, I call them, come out of the closet. So there are a lot of who I end up working with. And how I got here is somewhat interesting and I think important because it was not a clean trajectory. Like I didn't go to college and think like, oh, I want to be a coach of some kind and study psychology and graduate and start my business. I went to graduate school and got a PhD in organizational communication. And I spent my entire adult life up until my 30s preparing to be a professor. And, you know, got a job as a professor, spent eight years working in an institution, teaching students, and had what I would call an early midlife crisis in my 30s, where I really melted down like no one's business and was like, I don't know if I like my life. I don't know if I want to do this. And had all of the stuff that comes up for people around like, this can't be happening because I planned my whole life around this. And this is all I did. This I put all my money into it, all my time into it. I was in school for 9,000 years. But ultimately realized two things were happening through a very messy process in a lot of therapy and my own getting my own coaching and studying all of these issues. I discovered that the job wasn't quite the right fit for me, but I also discovered that I had just a beep show. I don't want to say the word, but I think we can all figure out what it is in my mind. It was just a disaster. I was like, my mind is you know, making me crazy. And it's the reason why I'm feeling so anxious all the time and so perfectionistic and exhausted. Like I was exhausted all the time by my life. And so that really led me to my career now. Once I started to kind of dive into all those issues and clean things up for myself and kept kind of trying to change external circumstances and realized that as the external circumstances changed, I brought my own stuff with me and was like, huh, seems to be that it's not just external issues that are the problem here. And when I started to clean up all the stuff that I was struggling with in my mind, my life started to really change. And that's when I realized, oh my gosh, there's something really here. And that's kind of what led me to becoming a speaker and becoming a coach. And so it was not A plus B equals C, which I think is so important to let people know because so many of us think I'm supposed to just like know what I want to be when I grow up go down that path, get a promotion, get another promotion and retire in my, you know, leadership role in my organization. And it is not that journey for many of us. This issue of challenges and problems following you wherever, like wherever you went, that I relate so deeply to that. And before I move into the next question, I, I have to ask you, Can you talk a little bit more about that and maybe how that comes up in your coaching? Because I think this is something that a lot of people will relate to. Yeah, it is. It's hard to, it's a hard thing to find because we just get the message constantly that if we change our external circumstances, we're going to feel differently. So it can take quite a few different journeys before you figure that out. And I see it in coaching a lot because people will jump ship on their careers or they'll change jobs a lot or they'll change roles and they'll be like, this is going to be the thing that finally makes me feel calm and confident and in control and feel fulfilled by my work. And so often, particularly when you have like an intense monkey mind, like mine very works fast and it's pretty critical and the issues really do come, they come with you, you know, like my perfectionism, which I did not identify until my thirties was messing up my career all the time because I was constantly dissatisfied and constantly had expectations that were too high for myself. And it didn't matter. I, I was like, oh, once I get out of grad school, this will be better. Oh, okay. Once I get in the job, this will be better. Okay. Once I'm a few years into this job, then I'm going to feel super chill all the time. And it just kept kind of moving and showing up in a different way. It would sort of morph into something slightly different. So it really wasn't until I started diving into that stuff in my own mind that I realized, okay, I'm the common denominator here. And so much of this that, yes, changing the actual career certainly has been fun for me because the content that I work with now is very fulfilling and I'm 100% in my zone when I'm a coach. But the other piece of that that's important for people to know is that the way I function is differently now. Like how I view myself 
you know, what I do when mindset issues come up is different now. My own perception of my own imposter syndrome and, and sort of having made friends with that and knowing how to deal with that is different now. My ability to make mistakes and allowing myself to do it is different now. So at least 50% of the deeper fulfillment that I have in my career now is because um, I have a different relationship with my mind and I know how to babysit it way better than I used to. (laughs) Oh, that leads so perfectly into the next question, which is just sort of where you're at now, both how far you've come, like how you relate to those situations differently, but then also what do you feel is like your next thing that you're working on? Yeah, I love this. This is such a good question. You know, the big one... The big one that I worked on over like the last probably two years that I'm just coming out of is money mindset stuff. There is nothing that will challenge money mindset like building a business, which was a whole nother, <laughs> <laughs> nother thing for me that I had not been prepared for. So I did a lot of pers- professional development work around my relationship with money, how it shows up, my ability to ask for money feeling like I was worthy of getting paid for things instead of not being like attached to an organization. So that was a huge new one. And and here's the thing about mindset issues, because we're going to talk a lot about them, I'm assuming on this podcast today, since it's me here, they don't go away. You know, it's not like I, I like suddenly mastered mindset issues and I never experienced challenges anymore. I just experienced them. They're different. It's like at each level, something different shows up. Every time I level up in my business, something different shows up. So for me, when I was leveling up, money mindset was all over the place. And I had to really dive into that. And now that that I sort of cleaned that up, I'm in this interesting space of I'm doing all this mind body stuff where for my in my own life, I'm learning how to use my own body to make decisions, like tapping into my intuition more, figuring out my relationship to my body and how to incorporate it into health and wellness and incorporate it into like anti-anxiety and all these sort of interesting, there's all this sort of entire world of study around mind body. I have a mind body coach. I'm applying these things to my own life. I'm bringing them in with my clients. So that's kind of my new fun and challenging. Like it taps into sometimes where she's having me drop into my body very in ways that are very uncomfortable for me because I'm such a mental person. I'm very cognitive and it's stretching me like crazy, which is so amazing because I start to remember all the discomfort that my clients feel when they're coming to me. And I'm really asking them to be uncomfortable and deal with things that maybe they haven't wanted to deal with. So that's my new baby right now is mind body, you know, development stuff and sort of diving into all that in my own life. <laughs> I'm starting to sort of feel like you're my twin in a weird way. So this conversation <laughs> is going to be really fun. I have a feeling we're going to go deep down a rabbit hole. I love so, it. Okay, so we're going to talk about some of the challenges that you see with the women you work with, especially women who are in a professional environment, because that's a lot of the audience for this show. Mm-hmm. Can we start with perfectionism? And can I share with you like what I've been working through as a starting point? Definitely. Okay. So the thing that I'm trying to figure out is, yes, like perfectionism is this thing that prevents me or anyone from like taking risks sometimes and it causes procrastination and it causes bad feelings. But like, I'm also fighting with this side of myself, A, that like genuinely likes to do hard things. Yeah. And B, like recognizes feelings of satisfaction, like when you push above and beyond what you thought. And it's like, I just don't know. I haven't yet found how those coexist, but I do think there's truth and value in creating something great. (laughs) And like, I just, I can't land those in my mind yet. Okay. I am so glad you said this. This is a great question. So I think it's so important to know that there's a difference between healthy ambition and perfectionism. So first for the listeners, I'll sort of tell them my, my take on perfectionism. I love Brene Brown's description that it's really about when you're trying to control something and make it as close to perfect as possible because you think it's going to shield you from judgment. You think it's going to bring love into your life. And that's like, that's really the like, if we like really ripped away the layers, that's the very, very underneath. Like if I do this job perfectly, if I look perfect, if I show up in my relationship perfectly, I'll be loved. I won't be judged. So it, the, the root of where it comes from tends to be around other people's perceptions of you, other people's evaluation of you. And it's different than 
I love the process of something I'm engaged in. Like, like this podcast. I love this process. I love talking about these issues. I want this to be an amazing podcast. I love the challenge of being asked something I didn't see coming. I like trying to be on my toes. There's tons of healthy ambition for me involved in this, but but it feels different. And what feels different is healthy ambition feels like a challenge, but it, there's a sense of flow in it. And it's sort of energizing. And perfectionism feels like anxiety and it feels constricting. Mm. So when you're in a perfectionistic mindset, you're constantly thinking about people externally. You're constantly thinking about how they're going to judge or evaluate this and making it good enough that everybody gives you that sort of hit that we're all trying to get where they externally, people are all telling you it's good enough. And you have this almost sense that you're protecting yourself from criticism all the time. And that's where I think it things get dangerous. And I also think the other piece of it, the more sort of literal or practical piece is just what I see with nine to five or so much, particularly with women, is that the expectations for how good something needs to be to be competent is way too high all the time, consistently, like what it needs to be to be able to be competent in my role is top notch the person who is like master that, or I have this sensation that like, I need to be an A plus at every single aspect of my job. That would be a a perfectionist. It's banana land to be an A plus at every single aspect of a job. Most of us have to put on many hats in our jobs. And it's not possible to master every single thing to an A plus. And in fact, when we try to do that, we end up sort of ignoring the pieces of our job that we really can be cultivating into like, our superpower pieces. So that I think is a good way to start thinking about perfectionism. Like, yeah, be healthy and ambitious and, and have things that you love. You want to make this podcast amazing and you get excited by it in the process of it. But it's so different than when you start to feel like, oh my God, there was this one tiny little mistake and you obsess about it and it gives you anxiety and you imagine people looking at it and thinking that it's horrible. And now you've fallen into perfectionism and that doesn't feel good or serve us. Mm, okay, so the it feels different. Like the mm-hmm. the way you're moving through the challenging thing is a vi- it's like a constricting feeling for perfectionism, and it's more like there's a glimmer of excitement when it's more ambition. But then it also seems like the outcome that you're very focused on is a little bit different when you're like when you get stuck in perfectionism. It mode. is external versus internal. Mm. So it, there's there's like and it's it's not that I don't care what people think at all. I mean, of course, if I'm like producing a product, I I do, but there's so much more internal drive around healthy ambition. Like I feel so much personal satisfaction when my clients are doing well. And when I have a session that was like amazing, like I love how much I had to think and how much I had to stretch that muscle. And like, it's like, I'm so proud of myself for the efforts that I was, I was making. And it, it feels almost, there's just such an internal drive behind it. And that feels, that's healthy striving and healthy ambition. And it feels good. It's so interesting because I'm doing all this mind body stuff now. It actually feels different in your body. You know, you can feel constriction in your body because it's your, your breathing gets shallow and your shoulders get tight and you sort of literally feel like you're being squeezed. And when you're in a healthy ambition state and you're kind of excited about something like me on the podcast right now. I don't feel constricted. I sort of almost feel like my body's moving forward. Like I'm going to jump through the screen. <laughs> like I'm like, hey, more, 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 more. I'm like excited, but I still want it to be a really good product. So I, I think that's a great question for your listeners. I think a lot of people get confused about healthy ambition ver- versus perfectionism. For sure. And like, this is something that's personally really important for me to untangle because I really want women who feel a natural ambitious drive and who have that engine in them professionally, I want them to feel free to follow it Mm -hmm. without fear. Because I also think that we live in a culture that I think on an unconscious level is uncomfortable a lot of the time with hyper ambitious women. And so it's sort of like so important for me when we talk about something like this, that like I unpeel these two different things and Mm -hmm. say like A is not B. Like you can want something huge for yourself and be so excited and so driven. And that's okay. That Mm -hmm. is totally okay. And getting stuck in perfectionism is okay too. Like none of it's wrong, right? It's just more... 
I think for me, I don't know, I'm curious what you think for me, it's just getting closer to like your true wants, like yeah. what it is you're 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 going after. Yeah, there's nothing, It's perfectionism isn't doing it wrong. The reason why, the only reason why I clean it up in coaching is because it doesn't feel good, right? right. It feels bad and it tends to make us take less risks. It tends to suck the fulfillment out of our work. And it, it literally kind of detaches us from what we're doing because we get so kind of consumed with making sure everything is is reaching this A plus point all the time. Healthy ambition, people tend to take risks when you're in a healthy ambition space because you, you're kind of pushing yourself and you're going for the thing and you're you're sort of willing to step into something that you know you maybe aren't going to master right out the gate that's going to take some striving and some work and some learning. And that's incredible space to be in. Perfectionism tends to be like when in my perfectionistic state, I did not, I didn't do things I wasn't good at. It was like, I stayed so close to the space that I had mastered. So it was like, I knew I was really good at teaching. I had gotten through graduate school and I had this whole like thing of building my life around all the things that I was very, very, very good at. And I was like, I, walking outside of that was petrifying for me because I was so used to staying in a space where I knew I could get pretty A plus close. And that's how I knew like, oh, this is all perfectionism. I'm just afraid because I was controlling people's expectations in my mind. because so I was like, well, I'm A plusing this stuff. So now if I step into something new, people are going to judge me for not being an A plus. Oh my gosh, that distinction that you said that like perfectionism doesn't make you bad, it's bad because it doesn't make you feel good. That's like, okay, that's a golden nugget for me because <laughs> at the core of a lot of this are these mindset challenges that women mm -hmm. run into. And I've been in spaces and situations where it almost felt like women were being shamed, not explicitly, but the way that like, quote unquote, mindset and professional development was being delivered to me mm -hmm. as a working woman, it felt very shaming. And it mm -hmm. made me feel like, oh, <laughs> I'm doubly broken. I'm triply broken. Like yeah. I suck and I have a confidence issue and I have imposter syndrome and I'm a perfectionist. And like that reframe that you gave, which is that like, I deserve to feel good. Yeah. That is so, so important. It is so important because this happens. I'm so glad you brought it up because this happens to, to so many of us who are like, who, who take in this sort of self-help world. <laughs> we love to feel like we feel bad because they were in a new job and we're feeling imposter syndrome. And then we'll start beating ourselves up because we're like, why do I feel imposter syndrome? I shouldn't feel imposter syndrome. Why don't I just think I'm worthy? So you feel bad because you're having a human reaction to something that's happening. Your brain is doing the thing that our brain does. You're in a new position. You're trying to figure out survival, literally in group, out group. So it's so human for your brain to do what it does and it freaks out. And then when, because we've been around this sort of personal development world, we'll start to be like, oh my God, I should, I should know better. I shouldn't be doing this way or behaving this way. And it's so silly. It's like saying I shouldn't be cold. You know, if you walk in a room and you get cold, you just get cold. You can't necessarily control that. We can give you tools so you don't have to stay in the imposter syndrome so that you can build your confidence. I always say to people in my sessions, like, if something's working for you, I'm not going to take it away from you. I have no agenda on how you should like move through your day and in, in, in this sort of, you know, objective way. My goal is always, I want you to suffer the least amount. I want you to feel good as much as you can. I want you to do the things that you want to do. So the only reason we take the stuff away is so you can feel good. It's not because something's wrong with you for having felt it. You know, you're having felt it because your brain's working really well. <laughs> Sometimes it works really well and it feels bad. Can you elaborate on the in-group, out-group piece that you mentioned and the brain stuff? That yeah. might be very helpful. Yeah. So, you know, it's so interesting. This this feeling of like fearing judgment and like wondering, are we doing okay? Certainly, we we know that women have been conditioned slightly different than men. So we have different expectations for what that looks like and for how much we're allowed to sort of stumble and fail. But on top of that, your brain is just designed to want to be loved and accepted for survival. You know, like you need to have a group of people, a community so you can survive, so we can get our food, our water, our shelter. So when you, when we take you and pluck you into like a brand new work environment, 
you're for sure your brain it thinks that its actual literal survival is at you know is at risk so it's going to freak out it's going to be like do people like me do they it's it's like whenever i'm i'm watching people give well intentioned but what i think is bad self help advice they'll say things like you just shouldn't worry about what people think and that should be the end of it and i'm like well kind of but that's not really a thing that most people can do with their brain because your brain is always going to worry about what people think to some extent because it's trying to figure out if it's okay and if it's going to survive. And if you get to the point where you literally never cared about what people thought, you're probably closing off completely emotionally. And that means that you're showing up very detached. So that's not what we want. Like Brene Brown always says, like strong back, like open front. It's impossible to close that off completely, but we certainly can can let the brain have a little bit of a freak out and then get a little bit of a distance from it, calm it down, get our perceptions in check and not have and realize like, oh, I'm not in danger. I'm not going to die. It's okay. I'm maybe not evaluating clearly what people are thinking. I already have people in my life that are loving me and caring for me. So I don't, you know, this in-group, out-group isn't as dire as my brain thinks it is. But knowing that our brain hasn't evolved to like where we're at, it thinks we're in danger a lot. And so it has what I call temper tantrums frequently. And (laughs) for people like me, and I'm sure many of your listeners who have sort of more active kind of cognitive thinkers, it's even more active. And left unattended, it will just make us feel pretty crappy on Mm. its own. That's why the mindset tools are so powerful because it kind of forces you out of that lower part of your brain that's just operating on, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Autopilot versus shifting to the front part of your brain that's more evolved where you can reflect and get distance and challenge certain thoughts and then sort of shift your perception. Nothing's wrong with you though because your brain is freaking out. It's doing that to keep you alive. And can you give maybe one or two tactical tips for anyone who's stuck in perfectionism? Like, is there anything people can do to try to start to shake the pattern a little bit? Yeah. So I think it's important. I kind of want to contextualize it because I think perfectionism, there's two different ways it tends to show up. For me, it's a huge part of imposter syndrome. So I kind of talk about the reason my mindset work, it tends to do imposter syndrome, fear of judgment and failure, um, and perfectionism kind of all together because it's like they're all cousins and they all kind of like hang out and they all sort of inter- overlap each other. Mm-hmm. And it's important to know that all these things are connected because sometimes I'll find people that are like, oh, I don't really have imposter syndrome. And then we'll start to break down what it looks like and feels like and their expectations of who they're supposed to be and how often are they allowed to fail and how much are they thinking about people's judgments. And they're like, oh man, <laughs> like I think I do have it. I just thought that like what I was seeing or perceiving in the world was objective and that I was just suffering for some other reason. So I think it's important to say that a lot of these mindset issues are sort of attached to that idea of imposter syndrome or that we're not good enough in some way, that we need to be better. Our expectations of who we're supposed to be in this are pretty high. And the way that we deal with it is kind of dependent on where it's coming from. So When I work with people that have a lot of imposter syndrome, I always look to see, are you someone that has situational mindset issues? So maybe you're dealing with like a lot of imposter syndrome and a lot of like expectations that are high because you're in something new. And when we're in something new, it, it, it's much more difficult. It sort of throws our mind into this freak out. And so when you're in something new, you've just started something, it's the first year of something, the first thing that you need to do is change the expectation that you should come in feeling confident. It's so important to do this because the idea that you should walk into something new, new job, new role, even if it's a new task you're doing in your job, and be already confident is crazy. That's like saying to the three-year-old, here's a bike, get on it and be confident while you start riding it. It's like, of course the three-year-old's not confident. They haven't been on a bike. Like, They're like, what is happening? I'm going to fall. I don't know how to do this. This is not natural for me. So drop this idea that you have to start confident. And I always tell people, like, expect that you're going to feel shaky. And don't make that mean, oh my God, something's wrong with me. I'm not doing it right. I need to get a different job. 
I shouldn't be, I should, they should have never given me this promotion. Don't make it mean that. Make it mean you're doing something new. You're on the bike. You're three years old. You don't know what you're doing yet. (laughs) You're going to feel shaky. So I think that's a super important one that I tell people who are in this space of like perfectionism, fear of failing, imposter syndrome. They're in something new. The other thing that I tell people is identify your biggest insecurities before you go in. So what are the things you're most afraid people are going to think? Some of the biggies for many of my women are like, people are going to think I'm incompetent. People are going to think I should never have gotten this job or this promotion. So I want you to like write them out and know ahead of time that these are going to be triggers for you and you're going to think you see this everywhere. That you've got a pair of glasses that you're putting on and they are your biggest insecurities. And it's so hard to get distance from them when we're in something that we're just now starting. So I want you to imagine, like, if I have a huge fear that people are going to see me as not competent enough and then I start this new job, you're going to see it everywhere and you can't trust that you're actually seeing it. And what I mean by that is when your boss calls you in and says, hey, you're doing a great job. We'd like to see you, I don't know, uh, work on your sales tactics a little bit. You're immediately going to be certain that your boss is telling you you are not competent enough for this job. (gasps) I relate to this so deeply right now. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I feel like you're in my mind. (laughs) I'm hanging out in your brain. I got your diary right before this. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, continue. So you're going to immediately, you're going to think that. So the reason I have to tell you ahead of time is because you you won't believe me if it's if you're already in it and I tell you you're projecting it. You'll be like, no, I'm not. I'm 100% sure my boss thinks I'm not confident. If you know ahead of time what your triggers are, then you can know that they're going to get poked real easily and you are going to have a reaction that is disproportionate to what's happening in front of you. So when your boss gives you that little bit of feedback and you feel yourself freaking out. They think I'm doing a terrible job. Oh my God. Ask yourself, was this, did they hit on one of my triggers? Did they hit on one of the things I identified before walking into this job? And if the answer is yes, then you need to know immediately that you cannot trust your evaluation of the feedback you just got. You have to know that you've made it mean something much bigger than what's actually happening. That requires, I don't know, like from my experience, I don't want to use the word discipline, but it's like you can know everything you just said. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the grip it has on you in the moment, it can just turn all of that upside down and it all spills out. And you're like, nope, this is real. This is real. It will. And you're right. It's it's literally why I have a job because (laughs) because this is part of what I'm able to do in coaching is get people. I have the ability to get the objective perspective and to slow the brain down and pull you out of it so we can see much more clearly what's actually going on. So it is, you're right to say it's much more difficult to do. The key is if you do it ahead of time and you know the triggers, and then you're not going to likely feel it in the first 24 hours of that happening. So the first 24 hours, you are going to be in like a story of all stories and you're going to be like having a mental meltdown and you're going to be hundred percent certain that you need to quit your job because you're not competent enough and no one thinks you can do it. But if you give the, tw- the 24 hours, let it run and then go back to the trigger you might be able to have enough distance from it then to be like, okay, is it possible that this fear is driving my interpretation of that conversation? And distance will often do a lot for us just because we can, we can like calm down our nervous system to even allow it to be able to look at it a little bit more objectively. But yes, you're right to know, like I always, like part of what I'll tell people is do it try it. And if you keep getting stuck, go hire a coach, like go, go to somebody on the outside who can help you get out of this because you can retrain your brain to get distance on these things and to sort of rewire it and to, you can work through that deeper insecurity so that you're not sort of projecting it all over the place. But those are two super important ones. If you're in a situation where like it's something new, if you are what I call a lifelong imposter syndrome person, which this would have been me. The difference is this, you have consistently throughout your life noticed people's evaluation of you, the things people tell you about how you perform, and they're like, you crushed it, you killed it, oh my gosh, you did great, is always 
inconsistent with what you think. You you think you did a C performance, people tell you you did an A, and that you've seen this throughout your life over and over and over again. You are someone that has lifelong. So it's not just situational. You bring it into every job that you do. You are someone that has what I call a broken gauge. And I love to use the visual, like think about the gas tank and think about the gauge. And when you're at a full tank, you see it at a half tank. So you're in a slightly different situation where you have to know immediately that your starting point is off. This is a big one for me, like in my speaking career, because of the way that that speaking works. And I don't, I can't engage one-on-one and like it messes with my perceptions of what's happening. So when I'm on the stage giving a presentation, like a keynote, my brain tells me constantly, nobody is interested. You're bombing. This isn't going well. I know now this is an imposter syndrome, a broken gauge. And when I'm on this stage, I literally know I can't trust my perception of what's happening because I know my tank is usually full when I think it's half. And the other thing that you have to do if you are someone that has lifelong, I mean, there's lots of things, but these are the the easiest ones, is you need to start literally trusting external feedback and asking for it. Because you can't trust your own perception of your performance. You have to trust other people's more than your own because you will always think it wasn't good. It wasn't good enough. It wasn't amazing. And it's going to be hard for you because what's going to happen is that like people will say to you, this podcast is amazing. And your brain will say, she's just being nice. (laughs) <laughs> right? It's going to come up with, it comes up with all of these ways to discredit external feedback. Like that was amazing. Oh, she's just being nice. She didn't know what else to say. She wants something from me. It's just because we're friends. Like I, I literally had a client once be like, people tell me I perform well, but it's because I'm tall. Like her brain had found this workaround that was like, I'm tall and I have a lot of presence when I walk in the room. That's why people see me as credible, but in reality, I don't, they don't really think I know what I'm talking about. So you have to be, start to start to notice like what are your ways of discrediting everybody? And you can't trust that. Your brain's just playing tricks on you. It's literally trying to convince you that that what they're telling you is wrong because of your own gauge is broken. And that it's almost like a muscle you train where like, Enough people tell me they love my keynotes that I started listening to it. I stopped trusting my own perception. I knew that the, my brain was going to do all that crazy stuff. I adjust the gauge from the stage. And I will even ask for feedback if I'm in that space where I'll be like, hey, let me know. What did you like? What didn't you like? And I will tell myself, okay, I need to rely on this feedback more than my own perception because my gauge is not accurate when it comes to evaluating this. Oh my gosh, that is so helpful that was incredibly helpful for me. And I'm sure that's going to be like shifting for people who are listening. I have like two questions that that this is bringing up for me. Yeah. They're, they're a little off the beaten path, but I'm really curious to hear what you would say. Yeah. Okay. The first is that like you talked about rationalizations mm-hmm. and how we're able to like make up this ridiculous story so that we can bounce the the approval, not the approval, but the positive feedback off of us. Yeah. And sometimes for me, that rationalization or that story, it doesn't exist in words in my mind. Like it's lurking and I don't know it's there. And it takes a while for me to to figure out what it even is because it's like, it's not always at the surface. Does that make sense? So you you know that you don't trust their evaluation of you, but you can't figure out exactly why. No, it's like, I know that I'm feeling bad. Yeah, I know that I'm feeling bad. Mm-hmm. And I I know that like something weird is going on. But the story that like, oh, this is just because I'm tall. This is just because X. Like, that's like buried like seven layers under. Mm-hmm. And then like when I uncover it, it's like, oh, my gosh. But like, why is it? Why can it be so hidden? I, I probably because you just need it. You're not asking yourself the question to even see. Most of mm. us don't. It's interesting. Mine was, I had a big one around, um, I got lucky. I've been lucky. That was a really big one for me because my mom used to say it a lot to me. And like, 
So I had this idea of like, oh, I've just been like lucky in my career and that's why I've done well, but it's not because I'm competent or know what I'm doing or it's not because I worked hard. It was like luck was always, but it's not like I knew that consciously until that was said out loud. And then I was like, oh my God. Yeah. Like that's, that's it. That's the one that sticks for me. So part of that is just your brain isn't going to latch onto it right away unless I ask it to. Mm. So you almost have to be like, okay, this person's given me positive feedback, but I can't feel it. And then you have to take some space to ask yourself, why would they give me this positive feedback unless they thought I did a good job? And you might be able to get to, well, they're giving me the positive feedback because, and there's, that's where you'll hit the thing. Like, because they are being nice, they just like me, they feel like they're supposed to, you'll probably be able to fill it in if you take enough distance from it and you actually ask yourself. The other thing that will help you, there's a book that I want to recommend to your listeners. If any of this is, you know, res, you know, they're really like, yeah, she's totally speaking to my journal right now. It's called The Secret Thoughts of Successful Women by Valerie Young. Hmm. She lists out a lot of the rationalizations and sometimes it just helps to have someone on the outside saying them. So you can be like, Oh my God, yes, I, I believe that. I believe that. Like, is it because you think you're lucky? Is it because people are being nice to you? Is it because you think like another one for me was like, Oh, my personality is likable. So like, that's why I've gotten this far, which sure. That's one of my competencies, but it would like, I would like disregard all my other competencies. Cause I'd be like, Oh, I just, I've gotten far because like I'm likable and people have just like, you know, let me slide, get away with things, so to speak. When, hmm. when I heard that one out loud, my brain was like, oh, yep, one of my rationalizations, interesting that I'm discrediting my own competency by sort of dismissing it as, oh, it's just because I have like a fun laid back personality. So yeah, listening to them, look for them, getting enough distance to ask the actual question, like, well, why else would she be giving me this positive feedback? That's fascinating because I'm, um... I, my story around likability is the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's an asset that I really try to leverage in my career because I think yeah. it's a core leadership trait. And I'm like, I want to nurture this and like build my soft skills and be able to connect with people so deeply, even like professionally at work. And yeah. so it's so interesting that you have a story around it, that it's like, it's the only reason you got ahead. And then my story around it is completely different, which yeah. is that like, likeability and our ability to connect is one of the keys to our ability to advance, connect authentically. Totally. And that's one of the reframes like that I would use with a client and that I use with myself is that no, my personality is actually one of my competencies and my ability to listen and connect with people and, you know, be interested on a deep level. Like I've nurtured that, right? And I've gotten better at that and I pay attention to that. And that is totally how part of what I reframed is like bringing it into my competency instead of like dismissing it as something that I just like flippantly used throughout my life and that somehow I'm not smart, but people just liked me. So it's just so fascinating how like, it all spin matters. What your what your brain spins and how it spins <laughs> it has a direct impact on how you feel and how you behave. That's what's so fascinating to me about the mind. It's why I love working with the mind so much is it, it's so subjective and it's so different from person to person. And how I spin one thing for you that would get you feeling good and showing up in your full potential could be so different than how I would spin it for someone else. The key mm -hmm. is always spinning it in a way that causes you less suffering. That's it. That makes so much sense. And I want to ask you one more like next layer in question. Yeah, do it. Which is, so there are a couple of like root causes, I think, to what I'm about to explain in the professional world. One is that there are a lot of people out there who are people managers and people on teams, and they don't have the, not even a fraction of the level of insight and understanding that you have around what it takes to give healthy feedback to motivate a person, right? So you might have people out there giving feedback in a non-helpful way. And also, I think with women, a lot of the times... This is like a real thing in so many work environments where there is hyper criticism of things that actually don't matter. Things like tone of voice, vocal fry, showing too much emotion. There are all these places mm -hmm. where not only like do women kind of get silently judged, but actually will be given feedback. And so I, I think what I'm getting at here 
is I think there are situations where the outside world, because we don't live in a world that, you know, that understands these things and always does things right, it can actually reinforce some of those deepest, darkest insecurities, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you can have a deep fear and it's it's not at all uncommon to then have a conversation with a manager or have an experience professionally where you're like, oh my gosh. And and oftentimes I think it's due to, you know, people could be well-intentioned or not well-intentioned, but people not understanding what strengths-based growth is and not understanding how to manage in that way. So I guess my question for you would be, What is your perspective on a situation where someone is kind of beating you when you're down? Not not like that's their intention, Mm -hmm. but women get this a lot where they're being told that something about them is wrong that's not wrong Mm -hmm. and things like that. And then it kind of sends you down a tailspin. Yeah, it's tricky for sure because you're right in that like there's no doubt, particularly I think in management roles, like because the way that industries often work is like, if you perform really well as a salesperson, then I will promote you to be a manager. Like people promote often based on performance in their current role. And when the actual job skills and tasks will be completely different at the next level. So instead of promoting because you're really great with people and personalities and knowing how to motivate people, I'll often shift you into a role based on just your performance in the previous role. So it for sure means that we end up with like a manager above us who doesn't actually have like what Buckingham would call the coaching skill, which is what you need to have to be an excellent manager, doesn't have the coaching skill, can't tap into people's strengths. It's going to, and it's going to happen all over the place. So it's definitely, I'm not going to say like, it's not going to feel bad, or you're not going to be in a situation where you're getting feedback and you're like, this doesn't make sense. Or the feedback that they're giving me is not great feedback. It's why I think mindset work is so important though, because you want to be able to suck the drama out of it and you want to be able to determine what I call fact from fiction. Like fact, my manager thinks that I need to lower my voice in speaking conversations. Let's say that's (laughs) what's happening, okay? And so that's the facts. And it's easy to then make that mean a bunch of stuff. Like he doesn't think I am competent. He's asking me to be someone totally different. This is ridiculous. Like we can just spiral into an abyss and have so much resistance around that. So it's it's like you always want to be able to suck the drama out and get to just, let's just be clean about this. Okay. He wants me to do this. I don't actually think that this is going to be helpful in this position or research shows this doesn't matter or whatever it is that you're going to do. So you can make a decision based on the facts and not based on so much resistance and emotion that can like, for example, I have a friend who called me the other day and she was like in a tailspin about a work situation. And she had the head, head, head person where she works who made a flippant comment in a meeting. And the comment was from objectively, I would say, pretty crappy. And it was a comment that sort of said that her job was easily replaceable. (gasps) Now, this does not feel good, right? Like, of course, it doesn't feel good. What we know, based on observing this man's behavior is that he behaves this way with lots of people. So this is not specifically just her, this is kind of who he is and how he behaves. She had had a sort of tense situation with him earlier in the week that probably led him to this sort of mini lash out or throwing his authority out. So her immediate reaction was like, oh my God, like, should I just quit? Should I just march into his office? And so we sort of pulled all the drama out and it was like, here's the bottom line. The people that she actually works under on a daily basis, and there's many of them based on her role. I don't want to say too much about it because I don't want to like anonymity, but they are really happy with her performance. She has minimal contact with this guy. So it was so easy for her to turn this into an entire thing that meant I should quit this job. He doesn't appreciate me. He thinks that I should leave because he thinks that I'm easily replaceable. And it may be true that he thinks her job is easily replaceable. But in the end, she likes her job. She feels good about her compensation. The people she's working directly under think she's doing a good job. And so I was like, if we literally didn't care that he thought this and we just let him think it, and let you move about your day and do your thing, how would you feel? And she was like, I'm fine. Like she would lose if she quits that job because she'd be losing the majority of what she wants, which is in an eight hour day, she likes what she's doing and likes how she's spending her time. And so he can be an idiot. 
and make this comment, he's not going to likely change and we're not likely going to enlighten him and get him to see that he needs to show up differently. She's going to just sort of move around him and continue doing what she wants to do. And when she gets in a position of power, she's not going to be an (laughs) a-hole, right? Like, wow. so yeah, it's just important to like get enough distance from what's happening that you don't end up punishing yourself because somebody else might not be good at their job or might've made a comment that wasn't the best. It's so easy to bring that in and and punish ourselves by turning it into a huge thing or quitting or having, you know, and then we end up sort of feeling like they moved on and here we are picking up all the pieces. Mm, Yeah. And I, I, I think that's a feeling that women feel a lot of the time, especially if they work in an environment that's very male dominated yeah. or maybe like very high expectation type of environment. I think that's so helpful though. It's like, I think we're we're entitled to feel angry yeah. when we feel like we're wronged and everything we feel is justified and then we can move through it in a way that's best for us. Yes. Definitely. Kind of like leaving it behind in a healthy way. Yeah. Because we can't escape having people in our workplaces that are going to be annoying for us. <laughs> is, no, we can't. There's no escape for that. And so it's so important that you kind of get good at getting enough distance that you don't let that engulf you because mm-hmm. it will really mess with your perception of like job fit or if you're really happy or because it's like you could take you could take two people who feel the same way about someone's behavior. Like you could take Sally and Susie and they both think that Bob is a jerk and behaves in a jerkish way. But Susie thinks about it all day and it sabotages her whole job. And Sally just like writes him off and moves on with her thing and is deeply fulfilled. That's what's so interesting is how much it kind of co-ops our mind can often be the difference between enjoying your work and really feeling good and connected to it and feeling miserable all day. I think that that's so, so helpful. And yeah, it's not worth it to get stuck there. It can be hard to get unstuck when you're stuck, but it's not worth it. The other thing that I want to offer that I think is super helpful for people, I remember when I learned this, it sort of blew my mind in so many situations. We often forget that like, we all have a rule book for behavior. So Like imagine yourself walking through the world and you have like a bubble above your head, almost like in a cartoon, and it's got a list of rules for how people should behave. And each of us has a different rule book. And like we move through the world with the expectation that people should behave according to our rule book. So if if, if you and I are best friends and I have a rule that says like you should never, ever be late. Because when you're late, it means you don't respect the person's time and you don't respect the friendship and you're really not being loving. And you might have a rule book above your bubble that says like, oh, if I'm friends with you and I love you and I'm 10 minutes late, it's no big deal because we love each other and we trust each other and you know that it must be because something was going on in my life. Now we meet at lunch and my rule book is like, you just disrespected me. You don't care about me. You're not prioritizing our friendship. And your rule book above your head is like, you know, oh my gosh, friends are flexible and loving. There's just two different rule books and we're coming in contact with each other. And we have this tendency to believe like our own set of rules. And if everyone doesn't meet them, we assume everything around us is messed up and broken and they're, they're like not abiding by the right rules. So it's really helpful to remember the person above me or below me or next to me at work has their own rule book for what appreciation looks like what it means to compensate, what it means to give positive feedback. And it's so easy to get stuck in this assumption that like, no, 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 it should all be by my rule book. And if it's not, it means fill in the blank. You don't appreciate me. You don't give me positive feedback. You're running this environment wrong. It's like getting to know the difference between what your preference is in your workspace and how you work best versus having an assumption that everyone needs to work based on your rule book. I'm having so many realizations while you're talking. (laughs) It's like so hard for me to decide what I want to ask you next because like as you're speaking, I'm just like, oh my goodness. Okay, I'm realizing a bunch of things. And I am back. And I'm hoping that you enjoyed listening to Erin as much as I enjoy talking with her. 
Again, I was blown away by how she just seemed to already know how my brain was processing these situations. And it was so much fun for me to get her perspective on all of these things. So much fun, in fact, that I held her captive. And instead of interviewing her for the normal hour-ish that I typically spend with a guest, I was interviewing Erin for two hours, which means there is more where this came from. And next week, I'm going to be airing part two of my conversation with Erin, which of course contains my beloved closing questions and the listener question, but there is some golden content coming up in there all about self-confidence and how it's not what we think it is. And Erin just shares such a valuable perspective on that. We also talk about the value in doing hard things and what we gain from situations that can be unpleasant. We talk about feeling awkward, feeling uncomfortable in our own skin at work and how that can be experienced and how to think through that and move through that. We talk about having patience when it comes to career growth and setting goals. There is so much more good stuff coming up. I can't wait for you to hear it. In the meantime, if you want to get in touch with Erin, you can check her out at her website, which is erinmfoley.com, and I will put it in the show notes. And if you found this conversation helpful, please share it with a friend who might also benefit from some of this information. I know that personally talking with Erin and listening back to this episode, which I'm planning to do many more times, and I already have a few times, really just helped me step back and see like, okay, this is normal. The way that I'm perceiving things isn't always reality. Things are going to be okay. And that feeling is priceless. And that feeling is a feeling that I want to spread. So if you know someone who could benefit from this type of information, please share this with them. And let me know what you think. As always, you know where to reach me. I'm on Instagram. I'll put my contact info in the show notes as usual. And I'm excited for you to hear part two. With that, I'm going to sign off. Wish you an amazing day. I hope you're doing well. And I'll catch you next week. Bye.